Good evening. Tonight we will discuss legal issues. These legal issues are amplified on global and virtual teams. You will also get time to work on your projects with your groups. I've created breakout rooms and after the lecture on legal issues will place you in your appropriate breakout rooms. <clears throat> you will need to re-click your video and audio buttons when I place you into those breakout rooms to enable these features in the breakout room. I will also visit each breakout room and make sure everything is working okay. <clears throat> when you have finished the uh, project work you want to accomplish in the breakout rooms, you are free to go or can return to the main room to ask questions. I'll be waiting there uh, in case anyone does have questions. So back to our lecture, uh, the first part of the class tonight. We'll start by placing uh, law in the framework of social analysis we have used in the course so far. As we've discussed before, there are four levels of social analysis, and they are presented on this slide. A higher level imposes constraints on lower levels. The top level is the social embeddedness level. This is where the norms, customs, mores, traditions, in other words, culture, are located. Level one has typically been taken as a given by most management or political theorists, and they ignore it in their calculations for how to make a better world. Uh, for example, um, we think in America that we can go into another area, do a regime change, and transplant a free market economy, and everything will be roses. However, institutions at this level change very slowly on the order of centuries or millennia. These informal constraints have a pervasive influence on the long-run character of a society. The cultural institutions have a lasting grip on the way a society conducts itself. Some so societies feel threatened by that type of change and take measures to protect themselves against alien values. As virtual team leaders, we cannot ignore this primary level of social interaction and assume that economic incentives we know in America can be applied in a contingent reward fa fashion, for example. We likewise cannot make blanket assumptions on the law or polity or in relational contracting in these other countries. These are legal concerns we must evaluate, and we will do so in a, this lecture. Laws regarding property rights, their definition and enforcement are a concern. Social institutions are the humanly devised constraints that structure political, economic, and social interactions. They consist of both social institutions that, are, that have informal constraints, sanctions, uh, customs, traditions, and codes of conduct and formal rules, as well as constitutions, laws, and property rights. Making massive change in, changes in these is a, is a prescription for chaos and unexpected consequences. <clears throat> So if we look at the top level, we have the informal social structures. Um, that's religion and culture. Uh, those uh, take centuries to millennia to form and change. And we discuss these in some detail on lecture five. The next level down, we have formal social structures. That's the judiciary and the legislature or polity. These institutions have uh, traditions and customs that take decades or centuries to change. And we've talked about them somewhat in lecture five and we're going to continue that discussion in today's lecture, uh, tonight's lecture, which is lecture 11. We also have formal organizational structures. 
the markets, how firms are organized, and contracting. Uh, these are institutions that uh, will uh, take year, uh, year, or year or years up to a decade to change. And that's what we're going to be looking at in tonight's lecture, um, lecture 11. And finally, we've got uh, the various resource allocation models for accomplishing work um, and, and the needs of a, a organization or a society. And that's your traditional incentives. And there's a continual response to change in these, and we've discussed them in Lecture 2 and Lecture 3. <clears throat> the rise of global virtual teams has generated legal concerns. The use of global teams is increasing because of the increased effectiveness from the access to distributed knowledge. A downside to these teams is that organizations may be violating labor and personnel laws. Likewise, there is additional collaborative content created to organize the team's efforts and produce the deliverables. This content is subject to record management regulations. There are laws from governments and there are also standards from recognized authority. Uh, for example, the International Standards Organization is a recognized authority. And global virtual teams must comply with these laws and most of the time with the standards recommended by authoritative bodies. Record management is an example of a global virtual team practice that is governed by both law and standard. Let's begin our discussion tonight with records management. <clears throat> ISO 489 is an international standard for records management. It pronounces that organizational management is responsible for the systematic control of records. This includes processes for capturing and maintaining in the form of records evidence of and information about business activities and transactions. <clears throat> ISO 15489 uh, defines a record as information created, received, and maintained as evidence and information by an organization or person in pursuance of legal obligations or in the transaction of business. So let's define some of the terms that are used in the ISO 15489 definition of records. Um, and we'll use the work of another standards body, the American uh, Certified Public, uh, in, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. So what are transactions and activities? Well, according to the uh, AICPA, an activity is a set of actions executed by an organization that results in a definable outcome. Uh, a transaction is the fundamental component of an organizational operation. It includes an exchange of assets or services with parties outside the organization or transfers of assets or services within an organization. Uh, these require authorization, execution, and recording. <clears throat> so what is records management? Um, ISO 15489 defines record management as the field of management responsible for the efficient and systematic control over the creation, receipt, maintenance, use, and disposition of records. And that includes uh, processing those for 
processes for capturing and maintaining evidence of and information about business activities and transactions in the form of records. How does the requirement for records management affect global virtual teams? Well, global virtual teams create more records because there is less face-to-face -face conversation and there is more written communication and more time-stamped telephone conversation. Virtual teams create a wide variety of electronic messages and store and access corporate data in a variety of locations. Supporting virtual operations substitutes electronic communications for face-to-face -face communications, and this creates a variety of records. Likewise, virtual teams may access corporate information anywhere and anytime on any devices. These characteristics of global virtual teams must be addressed in the management policies governing such teams. Organizations forming global virtual teams must have in place a record management policy that defines records and how to maintain them. The declaration of content as an official record at a minimum must identify who the owner of the record is as well as information to tag an official record. Likewise, the organization must manage content that is not an official record by defining a plan with a schedule for, its, for the record's proper disposition. In either case, um, information or metadata associated with electronic content must be listed along with descriptions about how it is managed through the life cycle. This part of record management is the use of documented supporting uh, technologies along with configuration of the contents form and taxonomy to be used to organize it for storage and retrieval. The organization is responsible for protecting confidential knowledge, for keeping records, and complying with legal regulatory statutes. <clears throat> the collaboration technology policy must establish procedures for managing electronic records generated by the collaboration tools. Furthermore, it must define procedures for training, enforcing, and auditing the collaboration technology policy. The organization must implement methods or tools that can be used by virtual teams to declare electronic content as an official, as an official record. And that's what we were talking about where we said that part of record management is the use of supporting technologies um, and the configuration of the contents form and preparation of a taxonomy or a, a category of directories to store and retrieve the information. <clears throat> the organization must develop a mitigation process if it fails to identify and capture official records from collaboration content. <clears throat> the organization must implement a repository for electronic content that is identified to be an official record. So if you have some electronic uh, content that has been deemed to be a, an official record, you must have a repository for it. The records in this repository must be accessible during the record retention period uh, defined in the organization's record schedule. And that can be the retention period uh, that, that is defined in the record schedule is the work of the uh, record management officer. They will go out and through statute, by standard, or by company policy, determine how long each type of record will 
need to be maintained and that will be put into the organization's record schedule. And then the, re the records will remain in this repository for later retrieval until they're no longer needed. So if uh, a record is only needed for three years and then uh, after that three-year period you can go ahead and get rid of those records from your uh, record management repository. A record should be retained only for the time defined in the organization record schedule unless there is a litigation hold from some legal action. There must also be provision for the secure disposition of records at the end of the retention period. The disposition methods must be appropriate for the type of media that hosts the content as well as the security classification of the content. The records retention policy uh, must consider the format of the content and the availability of tools to read such content. Uh, one example uh, we might bring up is that WordStar was the major word processing system on microcomputers in the 1980s, but that program is no longer available. So what do we do with uh, documents that are stored in WordStar format? <clears throat> uh, to prevent actual de uh, or accidental destruction of content that may become uh, official records, archiving features in collaboration tools should be disabled. And keep in mind that some collaboration tools have integrated record management controls. And the major ones will have record management modules either uh, built in by the company itself or third-party companies have prepared record management modules to work with them. <clears throat> Uh, in addition <clears throat> to records management, the organization must be able to support litigation holds for electronic content that is germane to a legal proceedings. There is also a need to protect electronic content for work outsourced to external parties, and this must be done through contracts. And one example might be non-disclosure agreements. And this extends to retention schedules and disposition that affect those external parties. So you have to not only protect the electronic content, but you also have to um, protect the retention schedules and the disposition policy. <clears throat> the collection of content must comply with legal and regulatory requirements in the countries where the team operates. In addition, it must comply with applicable organizational standards, rules, and policies. For example, to protect stakeholders, the organization must define rules for retrieving, using, and sharing electronic content between teams, between business functions, and with external parties. These rules must consider the integrity, need for encryption, and privacy of the content used in the electronic collaboration. Furthermore, some content may have historical value to the organization, even though it is not an official record, and this uh, content must be identified and archived as well. In addition to the legal requirements for records management, the virtual team also has other legal domains that uh, have problems amplified by the nature of global virtual teams. It's estimated that 1.3 billion business professionals will participate on virtual teams in the next decade. <clears throat> They may uh, unwittingly violate statutory, regulatory, or organizational mandates in the operation of those teams. The legal areas 
that are at risk include discrimination, uh, wages and hours, disability accommodation, and intellectual property rights. These issues are also uh, important to co-located teams, but as we will see, they are amplified on global virtual teams. <clears throat> okay, a U.S. company uh, is going to have compliance, financial, and le legal obligations under U.S. law and various regulations that apply to its uh, foreign operations. And one of those is going to be the U.S. Civil Rights Act of 1964 that makes it illegal to discriminate uh, based on race, religion, sex, or national origin. Uh, or organizations are most at risk for discrimination violations by the actions of their supervisors. On global virtual teams, as we have discussed in our leadership and uh, communication lectures, it's not always clear who is the supervisor and initiative is encouraged. So most uh, organizations include discrimination training for their supervisors and for global virtual teams as a remedy for this risk. Uh, so it should be included for all team members really, not just the team leader. The Fair Labor Standards Act uh, was signed into law by President Roosevelt in 1938. It set a minimum wage, overtime requirements, and standards for child labor. The act, which sprang uh, up during the Depression, uh, has undergone several changes since it was enacted, but it still protects uh, private sector employees as well as government employees. Um, and it requires organizations to pay a minimum wage, and it sets the standards for overtime compensation. With global virtual teams, members can receive direction and deadlines from multiple individuals who may be considered supervisors, um, including their uh, local location supervisor. Uh, to mitigate this risk, organizations should, simpli uh, should explicitly identify who is responsible for setting hours and deadlines. Uh, likewise, uh, they should determine and identify the individuals who can authorize overtime. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, of 1990, uh, the ADA, prohibits discrimination and ensures equal opportunity and access for persons with disabilities. <clears throat> um, it requires organizations to provide reasonable accommodation to disabled individuals. This includes individuals uh, with both actual or perceived disabilities as well as individuals who have important relationships with a disabled person. Uh, companies must provide such staff with a reasonable accommodation so they can perform the work despite the disability. With global virtual teams, a company may be a joint employer of someone covered by the ADA. The mitigation is that someone on the team uh, must be assigned responsibility to manage reasonable accommodation requests. The Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993 allows eligible employees uh, to take job protected unpaid leave or to substitute, uh, substitute appropriate paid leave if the employee has earned it for up to a total of 12 work weeks in any 12 months. Because of the birth of a child and to care for a newborn child, 
or because of the placement of a child with the employee for adoption or foster care, um, because the employee is needed to care for a family member, and that includes their children, their spouse, or their parents, um, when those uh, family members have a serious health condition, um, and it gives them the right to take job protected leave under those circumstances. On virtual teams, members can come from external organizations as well as from foreign countries. It may be unclear which geographic office or company um, is the real employer for a team member when they're on global virtual teams and therefore whether the team member is eligible for the coverage uh, defined by this particular Family and Medical Leave Act. Uh, someone on the team must ascertain which geographic location or company is the employer of each staff member. Um, that particular uh, location or company must be notified of this determination uh, before the virtual team begins working. This will help reduce confusion over the right to take leave. United States uh, intellectual property rights protect uh, advantageous knowledge through patents, copyrights, trademarks, and trade secrets. Other countries do not offer such exhaustive protection, and team members from other companies or countries may have different obligations. Likewise, they may have a different perspective on the rights to use the intellectual properties of others. Uh, moreover, team members may be subject to prior agreements governing the knowledge they can bring into the team. Uh, to mit mitigate this risk, have each team member identify all prior non-compete agreements. In addition, require all team members to sign non-disclosure and non-compete agreements with your company. Today, the laws of most countries have been modernized to address standard international commercial concerns, but national laws and regulations regarding intellectual property um, can still make a specific national law undesirable from the point of view of one party or another on a global virtual team. The United States has strict strict intellectual property protections, but this is not true for most of the world outside of the United States. Um, global virtual teams operate in a diverse set of legal environments. In most of the world, there is little enforcement of intellectual property rights so that the injured party has little recourse to correct the wrong. Likewise, there is little deterrence to violating the intellectual property rights of others. <clears throat> this is a loss of proprietary knowledge that gives an organization an advantage over its competition. And quite often, the company paid a substantial sum to get that proprietary knowledge. Uh, critical technical knowledge is discreetly transferred to competitors who did not incur any cost to develop that knowledge. And for a small organization, the loss of intellectual property can result in their demise. There's many holes in the intellectual property laws of various countries around the world and the, uh, many of those are involved in global virtual team efforts. So developing software in India and using it worldwide would involve risk for the intellectual property rights of the organization that has contracted for and paid for that work. Risk assessment must be done before the team is formed and should be a factor in both organizing and leading a global virtual team. This risk assessment is not a one-time effort, 
but must be continually revisited as more information becomes available. The advantages of one configuration of a global virtual team must be weighed against the risks of that configuration. Because of the lack of fair adjudication over intellectual property violations, many firms are becoming aware of the intellectual property security risk in certain countries. Effective mitigation of opportunism is dependent on a comprehensive and effective contract. And contract enforcement requires sufficient present presentation and a dependable adjudication or a dependable uh, judicial system. So, for example, uh, in the United States, um, work done for hire gives the payer intellectual property rights. This is not so in the United Kingdom. So you might go in with um, certain assumptions on who's going to own the intellectual property and that it's protected that are not valid if you're in the United States and you're engaging in work in the United Kingdom. Uh, just as one example, there's many others. So we've been talking about uh, using contracts to protect intellectual property, such as non-disclosure agreement contracts. Um, we'll also use contracts for uh, other services. How consistent is contract law itself across national boundaries? Do we need uh, contracts only with external parties? Uh, for example, in your project, would you need only a contract with, a, with uh, Lenovo? Well, it turns out there are contracts with internal employees as well, and that's uh, part of the uh, domain uh, of individuals that we need to contract with, both um, external and internal uh, people who are working on the team. Uh, global virtual teams may be formed strictly with internal staff, but they uh, often include external experts as well. Even with internal staff, signing non-disclosure agreements and non-compete agreements, um, these non-disclosure agreements and non-compete agreements are contracts. And they may be considered differently in different countries across the globe. In other words, are they legally enforceable? Well, that depends on the country uh, and countries that you're dealing with in your global virtual team. So not understanding the nature of contracts can cause problems. Contracts are the basis of the relationship between the internal employee team members and the organization. They are likewise the basis for the relationship with external experts on the team. So what law governs <clears throat> international outsourcing projects? Well, it's long been recognized that the parties to a contract can stipulate the law that will govern their, perspective, re, their respective rights and duties. Um, this is uh, the principle of party autonomy that is now protected through international choice of law conventions. The domestic contract law of any of the parties to the contract may be selected to govern the contract if it is litigated. And that gives you some protection that you know how the contract will be interpreted because if you make your own country, the United States contract law, the um, uh, choice of law, then you have a, a, a pretty good certainty of the enforceability of your contract. Uh, the conflict of laws area, uh, however, also um, encompasses uh, the questions about jurisdiction and this is true within the United States itself. Each state has its own body of law. 
So oftentimes, you know, you'll have um, agreements like the uh, license and uh, use uh, conventions for using software, and they'll say that uh, any disputes will be um, adjudicated in Delaware or the state of Washington or some other state. That's because, again, they know the nature of contract law in that particular state. And even within the United States, there's some variations. So choice of law, however, still presents, even with that protection, um, when you're dealing with international parties, um, you still have challenges. In a contract with a domestic vendor, the law governing the contracts is shared, well-known, and has established precedent in the United States. So there is a fairly uniform interpretation in its litigation. <clears throat> However, the story is different with international contracting. Um, it's long been recognized that the parties to a contract can stipulate the law that will govern the contract. This is the principle of party autonomy, and again, it's now protected through international choice of law conventions. Nevertheless, even with choice of law, there are serious issues. If a judgment is obtained in the United States, for example, how is it enforced in India? Conversely, would Indian courts know how to interpret and, um, and apply American contract law? Uh, contract enforcement, uh, re again, requires a sufficient definition or presentation of the contract particulars. So it has to be a valid contract. So what constitutes a valid contract? Well, in the United States, we know what does, and it's basically this. A contract is a legally enforce, enforceable agreement between two or more participants and it establishes their rights and their obligations. Uh, not every organization employee is authorized to represent their organization contractually. So only designated people are allowed to manage the contract. To be legally enforceable in the U.S., the following conditions must be met. Uh, the the uh, statement of work in the contract must be of a lawful purpose. Uh, there must be an agreement in the contract, that is an offer and an acceptance. There must be mutual consideration. In other words, it doesn't uh, benefit one side um, unilaterally. There's benefits to both parties. And only competent parties can uh, make a contractual agreement. So as a global team lead, make sure these elements are in the contracts for your team. For virtual teams, uh, realize who is your authorized legal representative. Um, and again, this is part of the executive re, uh, support we mentioned in the lecture on team building last week. The team member, the virtual team, must understand who manages contracts. The organization is represented uh, in a contract by agents, its officers, directors, and certain managers. The virtual teams uh, reviews, directions, and guidance related to a contract aspect of their mission must be brought to the attention of these representatives <clears throat> and their counterparts with any external parties. Be careful to realize that external programmers and engineers are typically not representative agents. So any notification to them by the virtual team is not notification in a legal sense. So just as an example, if, if you 
uh, feel like uh, the Lenovo engineers are falling behind schedule and they're not uh, following the uh, requirements, uh, definitions that have been established and agreed to. You wouldn't call up the engineers and expect um, a legal action, uh, a legal notification to have been given. Of course, you'll talk with the engineers to try and get them to do this work, but if you want to make a legal notification, you have to uh, notify the individual in their organization who is authorized to represent that company in legal actions. And your uh, individual uh, on your organization should be doing that notification. So it could be like a contracting officer in the federal government uh, notifying a uh, contracting manager that's responsible for um, performing the work of a particular contract. They may be the representatives for uh, handling uh, issues regarding that particular uh, contract and that would constitute notification. Um, the organization, which is the client, has an obligation to inspect the work of the supplier organization. Uh, the virtual team that requested the contracting has the obligation to conduct inspections in compliance with any schedule established in the contract. If a schedule is absent, the team must conduct inspections in a timely manner that will not interfere with vendor performance. So to avoid misunderstanding, the following aspects about inspection should be included in the contract. The inspection schedule, elements to be examined, test procedures to be followed, acceptance criteria, um, what vendor assistance might be required, the required records and formats related to the uh, transactions in the contract, and the personnel to receive the results. If non-compliant deliverables are tendered by the vendor, there are three general remedies available to the client. Uh, the first is spe uh, specific performance, which means to correct the issue. Uh, the second is reformation, which is the rewriting of the contract. And the third is rescission, and that is termination for default. A correction means the deliverable, the deliverable does not meet the acceptance criteria, so the vendor must make good at their expense. And this is the most uh, practical solution. Notification should be sent to the vendor explaining why the deliverable is in default and explain that they need to fix the problem. <clears throat> if both parties are agreeable, it may be reasonable for the client to accept the deliverables as is if appropriate compensation is offered. If no agreement can be reached, the client should ask the vendor to show why the client should not consider the contract in default and terminate any further activity. So the, the client asks the vendor, tell me why I shouldn't terminate this contract and tell me why you're not in default. It's, it's useful for the client to know uh, if they overlook something that weakens their case and that might dissuade them from termination. So it's beneficial for both parties to have that information from the vendor. If the client does terminate for default, then that's usually going to result in litigation. And there we go back to, you have to have a valid contract. It has to be com uh, completely defined uh, what's going on. And you have to have assessed the risk of uh, what, well, first you have to then establish what uh, uh, law, national law uh, 
is going to be used to adjudicate the case um, and then assess the risk. So you usually don't want to go to litigation. Um, you only do so if you have no other choice, especially in these international agreements. Uh, to finish up, we will review the uh, legal environments in several popular countries, um, countries that uh, are uh, involved with uh, global virtual teams. Uh, Robinson and Calicota have made an assessment of these countries' legal system, its regulatory environment, and its uh, stability. Uh, this is the conclusion of our lecture after I go through these next few slides. And I'm going to then divide you into the breakout rooms so you can work on your project. So Canada, um, it has a strong legal system that protects intellectual property and has extensive co contract law. Uh, its regulatory environment, uh, the federal and provincial governments support foreign investment and local operations of multinationals. <clears throat> uh, its stability, there's little political or economic risk. It's a member of NAFTA and the World Trade Organization. China. Um, according to business software, uh, China pirates 92% of its business software. Uh, Cisco and Microsoft have battled China over violation of intellectual property rights. Regulatory. Um, since 2001, China has relaxed many of its more onerous regulations, uh, regulatory interventions. In addition, there are special economic zones with tax relief as well. Uh, stability, uh, it's a member of the World Trade Organization. Um, it's under pressure by the United States uh, because of currency manipulations. Um, and it has established uh, alternative bilateral trade agreements with uh, most countries in the globe uh, to bypass American influence and pressure. <clears throat> uh, India, um, it has rigorous laws to protect in, uh, intellectual property rights, but it has very anemic enforcement of those laws. Um, regulatory, uh, it has, it offers 100% tax exemption to multinational businesses that extend their operations to India. And the tax rate for Indian corporations is 35%. A stability. Um, there's some tensions with uh, its neighbor Pakistan. And there have been some uh, religious protests that have disrupted operations within India. But by and large, fairly stable. Ireland. A uh, legal process is simple inexpensive and quick. Regulatory, a favorable corporate tax rate. Uh, additionally, it offers grants and subsidies to offset costs of deploying operations to Ireland. And it has low political risk. Mexico. Um, civil litigation in Mexico is rare because it is expensive and usually no damages are awarded. Um, regulatory, it's a member of NAFTA, uh, but it implemented a product standards, labor laws, and custom regulations to protect local ownership. Stability, um, Powerful drug cartels exert influence in major regions of the country, so that could be a concern. Okay, so we've uh, concluded our lecture, and I will now divide you into your breakout rooms. So we'll stop the lecture now.